Well, why don't we go ahead and, and get started with the state of the school talk. And I'm going to borrow from Clint Eastwood. I never noticed the, you know, comment that, that Clint makes to Tuco. You may run the risks, my friend, but I do the cutting. But that's sort of Dean-like, right? Because you cut budgets and things like that. So I kind of like that. What we'll do is we'll briefly review our mission. I'll make some comments about our performance that will be pretty frank and unvarnished and discuss a vision for the, the future. Um, like we discussed last year, there's a number of different ways to look at performance. Accreditation is certainly a MUD standard. Um, uh, the fact of the matter is we've had really dramatic changes in both our undergraduate and graduate medical education uh, programs that are reflected by standard periods of accreditation for, for both. Rankings are another way that, that, that performance can be assessed and um, candidly we haven't participated in these rankings uh, for reasons that are probably pretty clear when you look at where we are when we are participating in these rankings. These rankings are imperfect for sure, but there's information there that I think can be helpful to us. Student satisfaction and licensure performance, again, I put this in the world of MUD standard, um, and uh, uh, you'll, we'll, we'll share how we're doing, which isn't, which isn't terrible, but does give some opportunity for improvement. Now in the big picture, we're, we really need to look at how good we're, we're doing relative to our, our core mission. And the challenge here, it's kind of like being a politician, you know, versus trying to be a, a statesman. The, what you're judged on is short term, and the adherence to our core mission is what's happening over the long time. Um, but I'll, I'll share some information with you there. We'll talk a little bit about uh, financial performance and then we'll uh, move on to the vision for the future. So everybody in this room no doubt knows and remembers we were placed on probation by the LCME citing nine standards in non-compliance, one standard in compliance with the need for monitoring, and three standards in, tra in transition. And on October 21st, 2013, a sword of Damocles was lifted. We were removed from probation and found to be in compliance with all standards. And that's great. Um, we submitted a progress report in February. And uh, the LCME looked at our, actually we submitted it in December, and, our, and the LCME looked at this interim report uh, in February, gave us a letter finding all standards in compliance, and they dropped the monitoring need for ED5A, ED21, and ED33, as well as MS17 and MS19. To be very frank, that's absolutely fabulous. The fact that we could get to get from where we were with ED33, which is probably the most commonly cited bad educational thing, to removing the need for monitoring is really cause for some celebration. Um, I will point out that there was monitoring recommended for IS-16, which is diversity, MS-12 and 24. Um, one is related to uh, student debt and scholarships, and the other is related to adequate resources for students, which really is a reflection on our request uh, contemporaneously for uh, opening up some uh, spots for St. George's students. Um, FA5 and ER6. ER6 is another institutional resource issue. FA5 is scholarship and I'm going to spend some time talking about that. 
So hooray, we're off probation, uh, we're moving in the right direction. So what's this report mean? It means that we've had really great accomplishments in our curriculum redesign, and, and I can't uh, thank the folks involved with, with that more. Um, I mean, I, I, I really think that, that, that Sean and his group have done just an incredible, incredible job. Uh, curriculum committee really needs to be congratulated. Um, however, to be frank, the LCME still feels a need to monitor our work with diversity, which is more reflection on wanting to see that we're sustaining some of the good things that we've done. The transfer students I mentioned, the student debt, which continues to be a, a challenge, and faculty scholarship, which will probably take more of my time tonight than most of us want to hear. So who do we think we are? We think we're a medical school focused on training primary care doctors, as we should. We think we're focused on training doctors to practice in rural areas. And we think that we give our students a great preparation for residency. In fact, when our alumni meet and get a little liquored up and talk about the good old days, they talk about how coming out of Marshall, we're ready for for practice, we're ready to do our residency, we're much better prepared than those kids in all those other places. Okay, well if we look at our student satisfaction, it's not too far from the national average, but it's a little below the national average, which is a good number. This is on a five point scale, five is like really good, and the national average is 4.3. And we're tipping along at about 4.1 consistent. If we look at how we're doing with preclinical stuff, there's a little bit of movement year to year. But in general, we're about average. On the clinical side, there's some areas where we're substantially above average. Family medicine is consistently above average. OBGYN is usually above average. And pediatrics is consistently above average. I'm sad to say that in internal medicine and surgery, we're about half a point below the national average going back as far back as I have data. And that's something that we're going to have to address. If we look at our rankings from US News and World Report, the research, as expected, we're not considered a, a major player. If you actually look at where we are, we're 97 out of 114 participating schools, or 122 out of 138 schools um, on the NIH list. To be blunt, that's not a big surprise. But this is a surprise that we're not ranked in primary care. And some of that's related to the calculations, but some of that is related to something I'm going to talk about in a couple of seconds. And we're not listed in rural medicine, even though West Virginia University and West Virginia School of Osteopathic Medicine both are. And, and the reason that we're not ranked higher is our peer assessment, i.e. deans and chairs at other schools, and our residency director scores are very low. Again, on a five-point scale, we're in the low to mid twos. We're below average. So the cold hard facts are, even though we think we're great at teaching students to be primary care docs, we're not on the radar screen. And we're not on the radar screen for rural medicine. And 
more damning than what deans and other chairs think, the program directors rate us as a below average training site for medical students. These are the cold hard facts. Well, when we talk about research, and I think it's very important that we we, we work on, on, on elevating our profile in research. Um, the simple truth of the matter is, is we've never been a very, very serious player in this area. And if you exclude the fact that we used to do pretty well with earmarks um, and had the best senator in the country at bringing money to, to our state, um, uh, once they've gone away, or have at least become more difficult to get, we're in a pretty, pretty weak position. And if we look at our scholarship, just in terms of the peer review papers we publish and the book chapters we publish, you can see we had a response to the LCME citation. But we are tailing off our productivity it certainly hasn't gone up since 2012, and it looks like it's tailing down. If we look at our graduate school, we have some problems there, and I think this is very relevant because I see our graduate school as being a very important component of our research base. If we look at our graduates over time and our basic science faculty have all heard this from me. Nearly a third have graduated without first author research publications cited by PubMed, which is distinctly out of the normal range. We've got an incomplete formal curriculum and as everybody knows, an inadequate number of well-funded research labs. Probably more damning to my mind is that we maintained an inadequate database to allow effective analytics to be applied to what is, to my mind, a problem. Now, I'm just going to talk briefly about how we are trying to address this, and then I'm going to move on and focus on the, the, the medical school um, proper for the rest of my talk. Uh, doctors Green and Eggleton have been appointed to oversee the, these programs, including the PhD program. Task forces have been formed uh, by, by participating faculty to work on curriculum development, laboratory placement, and revising our, our clusters. And the dashboard's already been developed. Um, Al's actually put it up uh, on the web for, for some of the administrators to look at to effectively track the students effectively. Too many effectively. Effectively track the students. Okay, well let me switch back to the School of Medicine uh, MD program and look at who, who's coming. Um, as everybody can see on this graph, we are a West Virginia school and primarily our class is made up of West Virginia residents. We had a dip when we were on probation, and that dip has gone away now that we're off probation. Um, for reasons that make almost no sense to anyone, we seem to consistently attract less than 50% women. Uh, the Bachelor MD program, which we're just starting, may turn that around a bit because the, the best qualified applicants, and I believe uh, 10 of the first 10 acceptances we gave were to young women. So maybe that'll help, help bring us up closer to 50-50. If we look at the credentials of the students that come in for whatever these credentials are really worth, it's been pretty consistent with an overall GPA between an A and a B, and MCATs that are around 28. Now understand, and this hurts us on our rankings, but understand that this is lower entry criteria than many of the surrounding schools, 
and puts us in a lower portion of medical schools across the country. And I mention it's relevant to the rankings because this is, I think, 20 or 25 percent of both the primary care and research rankings of medical schools by U.S. News and World Report, how selective your entry criteria are. Um, as we're going to see in a few slides, we want to recruit primarily West Virginia uh, residents to our school, which uh, means we're kind of, of picking all potentially qualified people because of our, our desire to be relevant and train a workforce for this region. Uh, but not to belabor the point, when we're looking at how our students do going forward, how our students do uh, on their MLEs, how our students do when they match for different um, residencies, especially competitive specialty residencies, our kids are starting off 10 points behind the kids at Penn or Wash U in their MCAT. They're, they're a different, um, a, a different uh, scholarly level um, going into this mix. Now, why do we focus on West Virginia students? Because we know that they're much, much more likely to practice in this region. The kids that, that came from West Virginia had a, just over a 40% chance of staying here. And the kids who came from outside of West Virginia had an 8% chance of staying here long term. And our core mission, to my mind, and I think to the minds of most of us in this group, our relevance is related to our adherence to the core mission to train a workforce for this region. We're not just one of 141 medical schools. We're the medical school that's trying to serve southwestern West Virginia. Our debt is a problem and continues to be a problem. I didn't put the 2014 numbers in because I didn't have uh, reference numbers uh, from uh, WVU or the osteopathic school, but uh, um, our own debt is going up a little. Um, despite all the things we're doing to, to uh, correct it, this is, this is a, an ongoing battle. And uh, we really are working hard to, to fight this. Our scholarships have improved. Um, scholarships and waivers have gone from about 400,000 a year to 2 million a year. But we're still struggling in this battle against uh, student debt. Um, except for some challenges in the middle part of uh, this last decade, um, we've done okay with step one with a pass rate that's pretty class close to the national average. Uh, these are clerkship uh, um, uh, shelf scores, and uh, you can see the family medicine uh, runs an average of about the 50th percentile, sometimes a little better. Internal medicine, a little bit under the 50th percentile at the beginning of the year and just about the 50th percentile later. OB, and we've got to figure out a way for David to uh, share the, the cracked code with the rest of the departments, but OB consistently does uh, a well above the 50th percentile. Um, PEDS, um, typically a little bit above the 50th percentile. Uh, psych has had so many changes that, that it's hard to look at things over the, uh, the long haul, but, but uh, we're now getting to a point where our numbers are, are, are looking better. Surgery consistently below the 50th percentile. We look at our step two CK pass rate right around the national average. And the CS exam, despite a dip 
Uh, last year, which we were able to identify the causes for and fix, and I commend Amy Smith and, and, and others for, for, for doing this, uh, we're now right back up to the national average. If we do predictions based on the MCAT and undergraduate GPA, uh, our results on step one are considerably above what we would predict. And they're right in the mix of what we would predict for step two CK. So our school preferentially accepts West Virginia residents. I didn't share this with you, but, but we accept almost somewhere between 40 and 50% of applicants that are West Virginia applicants, and I dare say darn close to 100% of qualified West Virginia applicants are given an acceptance letter. And, and because of this, because of our focus on, on this small population, our entry MCAT and GPA are low. Our students are just about average in their confidence in the medical school experience, but several clerkships consistently score poorly in student perception. And interestingly, the clerkships which are well received by the students tend to have higher average shelf exam performances. True, true, and I think related. Our students score just under the national mean for USMLE Step 1 and 2CK. And when I say just under the national mean, I mean a couple of, of uh, points on the three-digit score and one percentage point lower on the pass rate. The performance rate is somewhat better than we would expect from step one based on the entry GPA and MCAT statistics. Uh, we have a relatively high percentage of students that pick primary care residencies, although of course this can be misleading since internal medicine counts as a primary care residency and you can do specialties and subspecialties with that background. Um, in fact, uh, we, we actually look a bit better than WVU in this regard um, and are just a little below the osteopathic school. If you look at where people end up practicing, and this is a five-year period from our graduates between 2003 and 2008, it looks like we are right up just under 40% practicing in West Virginia, around 25% doing primary care here, and about 8%, 7% uh, doing rural primary care in West Virginia. One of my former bosses used to say that money's only the second most important thing, but without it, you can't do the most important thing, whatever that is. So we do track money, and the reason I'm still standing here is, as you'll see, we continue to run our operation in the black. The school is continuing to grow its economic footprint. Uh, we are seeing increases in our uh, support from the practice plan, from the hospital, uh, from endowment and gifts, even though the numbers look small, the change has been pretty dramatic. Um, we're still pretty weak in grants and contracts, and uh, we are intentionally low on tuition. If we compare ourselves to an average of medical schools, we're small. We are much smaller than the middle medical school, the average medical school. Um, and I think this is very relevant when we see where we are in terms of total dollars. Um, because when you look at it proportionally, it's clear that we enjoy a lot more hospital support and are more dependent on a practice plan than the average medical school. 
Now I show this slide, I don't know if anyone from the hospital is in the audience, to show that if we're supporting a academic medical center that will be the sum of Cabell and St. Mary's, there's actually some room here because that will bring us to actually an above average size for an academic medical center associated with a medical school, leaving some room for, for growth and leaving some room for growth with our practice plan. Um, obviously, we're lower in our grants and our tuition is right around the national numbers. Our tuition rates are very low and our, our student size is small. But again, if you normalize it for our overall small size, that's, that's just where we are. Now our state support is shrinking, but it's still important. It was 11% last year, it's gonna be about 10% this coming year. Um, and as discussed, we're very, very dependent on our clinical operation and we support a hospital with a smaller clinical faculty than, than most hospitals or supported. If you look at how we've done over time, we are growing. Um, just five years ago, we were down in the ballpark of 120 million, and now we're up to something around 160 million. And we're consistently showing a positive gap between our net revenue and net expenses. And although you'd never want to run a real business this way, this close to the edge, um, for medical schools, I think of this as a healthy margin. A 3% margin is something that uh, uh, will keep me gainfully employed. That's supposed to be funny. Anyway. So what are we and what do we aspire to be? We're a small allopathic medical school with a focused mission to serve West Virginia and the Appalachian region with a motivated, engaged faculty. Our research footprint is small and the scholarly output of our faculty is substantially lower on average than that of our reference group. We're relatively busy clinically, and I'm going to show you more on that, and function as an important player in healthcare delivery in southwestern West Virginia with considerable relevance to the Huntington region dare I say, almost unique relevance to the Huntington region. We strive to provide a student-centered experience which is effective at training our students to begin their medical careers. This is a graph showing clinical productivity by department, expressing all of our clinical faculty to the median MGMA number for that specialty or general type of practice. For years 2013, 2014, and then annualized years, uh, annualized fiscal year 2015. And this tells a story uh, that I think is quite remarkable. Overall, we're, we're hitting Lake Wobegon territory. Everybody's above average. This is great and this is the way it should be. The 50th percentile is becoming a mud standard and I think that's really important. And there's a couple of, of, of areas where I just have to point out the incredible job that's been done in psych by, by John Walden and then by Suzanne Holroyd at really just changing the culture. Um, psych was in this range for a decade before this change. For 10 years, it was just the way it had to be. And it's not that way, and it doesn't have to be that way. There are still some areas of opportunity, and if we do this as individual faculty, and we will, there are areas that, that we can continue to improve in. But the overall change for the organization has really been nothing short of remarkable. 
There's a couple of small areas where we're persistently low, but uh, again, the overall change has been really, really um, remarkable, gratifying, whatever positive adjective you want to use. And, and I have to give a lot of credit to Buffy Hammers and, and Joe Werthammer, as well as our clinical chairs, for making this happen. The research world is a tough world. I didn't put in the 2014 numbers, but the reality is it's going to get harder and harder to get less and less from the feds in terms of research monies. It's going to require lots of effort to, to move this needle. We are definitely entering a phase at the National Institutes of Health where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Now switching gears, one of the great advantages we have is the incredible relevance we have to this region. And this is, is illustrated or exemplified by how much we're a part of medical care in this region. Now, I came from a place where we were at about 11% 11, 11 of the Toledo market. If we disappeared one day, nobody would really have noticed. We're here, we're more than half of the local, you know, market, whatever you want to call it, local health care delivery force. We are extremely relevant to this region. Now, one of the things that we've looked at and doing and are starting to do is trying to measure the faculty effort in terms of a, uh, an almost theoretical physics kind of unit called the semester hour equivalent, whatever the heck that is. And, and as you might expect, most of our effort goes into clinical service. Two thirds of our effort goes into clinical service which is not surprising since the vast majority of our funding comes from clinical service. Let me backtrack just to illustrate that. I mean, if we look at the practice plan in the hospital, we're, you know, definitely in that same kind of ballpark. Um, I mean, that's, that's the national numbers. Here, we're like 70, 70% of our total revenue is related to our clinical operation. So it's not surprising that this is where most of our activities are. Um, maybe some of this is the way we've counted things, but we counted administrative um, activity as our second biggest group um, with teaching uh, down around 6% along with scholarly activity in the same range and advising and uh, funded research being shown on the screen. That's just another way of looking at it. Now, if we look at the different departments, you can see that although um, uh, they're all different, there's tremendous overlap between them and the trend tends to be very similar, except for, of course, the basic science departments that don't have, you know, clinical activity. If we look at these data, we find that our administrative activity correlates positively with advising, funded research, scholarly activity, and teaching. In other words, the Don Primeranos and the the Gary Rankins of our, of our institution, despite being bean counters, I'm, I'm one too, guys, are doing research or participating in advising or are teaching, okay? And as you might expect, uh, the teaching is correlating positively with advising and scholarly activity. Our faculty are not looking at these tasks as competing with each other, but they're looking at them as a synergistic thing. Now, if we look overall at scholarly activity, 
will find a negative correlation with clinical service. But candidly, that's an artifact. That's an artifact related to the fact that our basic science faculty are better at scholarship and research than our clinical faculty as we'd expect them to be. If we just look at the clinicians, administration correlates positively with advising scholarly activity and teaching and is weakly positive with you know, clinical service and teaching. So in other words, people who teach do have time to do clinical service. They do find time to do scholarly activity, et cetera. And for the basic scientists alone, um, it doesn't look like teaching activity is a negative regarding funded research or scholarship. We look at a department, and I picked on surgery because it's big enough that nobody knows who any of those boxes are except for Dr. Denning up here, but we don't have to talk about him. Uh, you see there's a spread. There's a spread that's, that's pretty broad. And, and I think that, as unpleasant as it is, one of the things I have to ask our chairs to do is comment on folks that don't seem to be contributing a lot to any of our missions. And this isn't unique to surgery, this is part of just all of our departments. But I think we want to get to the point where we have MUD standards in terms of what our activities are. If we look at what we've been doing lately, clinically we've had a fairly large amount of services being expanded. We've brought dermatology into the fold with, with Dr. Yarborough's hire. We've expanded ophthalmology and Dr. Hatfield has come on board and Radiation Onc has become part of the med school with Dr. Sharma. In both retina and Radiation Onc, or I should say ophthalmology and Radiation Onc, we've done the experiment to partner with people who are in private practice to help us with our academic needs. We've developed some new training programs. In particular, Dr. Holroyd has gotten a psych residency here in record time, um, world record time. Actually, I didn't think it was possible that you could have a, a residency approved so quickly. And they've had a great match. And there's a terrific first year class coming in. And it looks like we are going to actually fill a second year class from people who've heard about Suzanne's success. We are working closely with our hospitals, provider-based clinics and 340B are generating funds that we can use for research and education. And uh, uh, we're very excited about the merger because of the possibilities this is gonna create for medical education in this region. We are moving into more capitation agreements and we are looking at partnering with, with, with players in, in healthcare. Um, I believe that we are going to see a blend of capitation and fee for service in the coming years and we're going to have to be very nimble and clever to maintain a margin in, in this complex environment. Research, there have been some new hires through MER. Uh, we've hired Dr. Sundaram and Davies in the last couple of years. We almost had an absolutely fabulous biochemistry chair and at the last minute that recruitment went south, but Gary uh, Rankin assures me we're gonna get somebody just as good and we're continuing to look trying to seed support of additional research and there have been some, some new grants that are probably worth mentioning. The educational front, the curriculum's evolving. I'm really excited about what Amy, um, Mike McCarthy, uh, Charles Gulo, uh, Bobby Miller are doing in terms of student services. 
Uh, we're continuing to work hard to raise more scholarship support, and we've been able to hold tuition constant, and actually now we're looking at trying to limit, well, not look at, we're actually limiting the amount that our students borrow to try to get a handle on this rising student debt. I'm very excited about the BSMD program that Jennifer and Eric have, have put across and, and we've recruited our first class. The kids are absolutely outstanding and candidly these kids were going to leave West Virginia. We are retaining our best and brightest kids with this new Bachelor MD program. The MD-PhD program has been revitalized. We're beginning an INTO University of London collaboration that, that Bobby has been spearheading. And uh, there are some other things that we're looking to do in the future. Um, administration, I hope that we are getting to a point where, where things are transparent and people are feeling the responsibility and the authority to do things in their, in their areas. So what's wrong with where we are? What's wrong with the status quo? Well, we have a low amount of research grants. And research grants remain necessary to support research and scholarship. And these grants require more than the horsepower we currently have. We've got to find a way to expand our research base. And we've got to take advantage of our small size and collegial atmosphere by collaborating more and more um, uh, to make things happen. It is very clear to me from this year's budget that the state support is shrinking and will eventually become the minimus probably within all of our professional lifetimes. Um, the initial projection was two million out of our um, 13 million and change budget. We got it down by good old West Virginia politics to something more manageable, but if you look at last year's cuts and this year's cuts, it adds up to about a million from where we peaked. Tuition isn't going to bail us out. The student debt won't allow big increases in tuition. And we don't want to have a class size that's ginormous. Um, in terms of total numbers, figure about six million a year, seven million a year come in the form of tuition on our $160 million budget. It's not going to be a huge player. As discussed before, fee-for-service will be replaced by managed care to a substantial degree, and our reimbursements for fee-for-service will only decrease. And the hospital business is going to get tougher as well. Last year, we talked about the pros and cons of being too big or too small, right? Kind of like when you ask your surgical attending as a medical student, do you want the knots cut too long or too short, right? David, that's got to get a smile, right? <laughs> um, the fact of the matter is we've decided we're going to get too big. We're, we're going to get too big to fail. I just don't see the, the possibility of maintaining relevance by getting smaller and leaner. No one cuts themselves to success. We, I believe, have to grow to be as successful as we should be. Back to the, you know, Clint Eastwood analogy, the good. We have a noble mission and relevance here that is unparalleled. It is so cool how much we matter to this community. We perform a great deal of the clinical care. We care for an underserved population. We train the docs that go out and practice here. We really matter to this part of the country. We're striving to be student-centered. We have a great alumni with tremendous loyalty. Heck, a lot of the alumni are right here in this audience. 
and we're making a good effort by any objective standards. And we've made enormous improvements. Bobby can tell you that we're used as the example of how to address curricular reform. When, when the LCME secretariat talks to programs that are coming up on review, we get called as the example kids to explain how, how to do it. It's a good thing we didn't say, well, I don't know. <laughs> the bad? Well, we're not as good as we'd like to be. I saw John Walden come in a little while back. Remember John telling me, very frankly, that we're, you know, a great center for international medicine and, and rural health care. And, and I believe that we are, but we're not appreciated as such by the rest of the country, by the rest of our state. I mean, the fact of the matter is, that's not how we're perceived. We're considered on the national playing field less of a player in rural health than the osteopathic school and WVU. It's the way it is. And our residents, i.e. the students that become residents and go to other programs, the peer assessments are not that flattering. In addition, our research infrastructure is still very weak. So weak it can't support, you know, the, the the poor get poor. We don't have the numbers of, of R01 funded investigators to apply for, for instrumentation grants. We don't have the research base to apply for Howard Hughes grants. These are sources of revenue we can't get until we get better at this research aspect of our institution. And like it or not, again, my job is to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. We're still on the cusp of inadequate scholarship. We're, we're seeing a, a tail off after an initial very positive response to the LCME citation. And both the LCME and the ACGME continually ding us for a lack of scholarship comes back on all of our residency applications. When I say all of our residency applications, maybe it isn't all of them, but it's most of them. And, and candidly, this is the point I'm trying to get across, there's a relationship between the scholarship and peer assessment. If we want to be known as a great center for training primary care doctors and doctors who practice in a rural region, we gotta write about it, or else no one will know that we are. On the subject of being more student-centered, we gotta embrace our role as teachers and mentors, strive to make things better, teaching sessions better, exam questions better, and we're gathering data now. Charles and Bobby are gathering data that, that Mike is, is collating and recording <coughs> that, that gives us some idea how exam questions are behaving so we can use good exam questions. I, Mike, are you in the audience? How many questions have never been answered incorrectly? 21. Okay. I think we should get rid of those 21 questions. If we ask the same question every year and every kid gets it right, it's not a great discriminator, right? We might as well substitute, do you like ice cream? This is, these are things we can do. We're gathering these data, now we have to apply them. I think we ultimately have to transform our preclinical education to be better vertically integrated with our clinical education. And we're working to do this, but it still needs more work. And candidly, we need to transform our clinical education programs so that they are universally student-centered as opposed to easy to administer. Now, we've taken steps, no pun intended, 
to be enabled to predict step scores based on the data that we gather. These are, these are some analyses that, that Mike McCarthy and I did. And what we find is when we look at the MCAT and GPA, in our population, we can predict about 10% of the variance on the step one and step two score. When they take their first exam in medical school, first exam, that predictive capacity gets up to almost 30% for step one and over 20% for step two. And then it goes up from there. And now that we can identify these kids, there's things we can do about it. I, I blocked out all the kids' names in year two, not that you could have read it anyway. But yellow means at risk, and whatever that pink color is, it has a better name than pink, but that's what I'll call it. These are kids that we think are at high risk. And we can see how kids do over time and whether they're getting out of the range where we need to be worried. And these are kids that we can, can spend more time in identifying, we can develop programs to improve their success, and we can, and this is a hard part, but it's relevant to, to challenges that we're having with, with, with our fourth years. There needs to be cold, hard facts discussed when talking about the long-term goals. Kids who are repeating year one probably aren't going to be competitive for an ortho residency, where you have to be as strong as a bull and smarter, but it's still hard to get into. No offense to Dr. Ali and his group. Um, we need to be very frank with our students, and we need to counsel them as best we can and help prepare them for, for good careers. How do we improve our scholarship? I think we need to aim towards a MUD standard of 25% of all basic science faculty salaries on extramural grants. The national number is over 50%. We need to develop better graduate school courses, and I believe this is in progress. And we're going to have to recruit some additional funded scientists with international reputations but I don't want that to be the entire way we transform. If we can't do some of it by organic growth and development, it's, it's much, much, much less satisfying. I think we need to embrace our personal obligation to be scholarly. If we're teachers, we write about how we're improving the way we teach. If we're primarily clinical, we write about interesting cases with residents and students, and or we write about how innovations have improved our care. If we're administrators and we have successful programs, we write about them. And I'm really proud of Joe Wordhammer and the PEDS group, who wrote a beautiful little report on now care that tells how they improve care and save money for this region of the country. That's terrific. It's not molecular biology, but it's still terrific. I think, and this is how I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to something Steve Kopp told me when he heard one of my talks and said, you know, this is great, but once a year ain't going to cut it. It's got to be more than a once a year revelation as to where we are. This has got to be something that goes on periodically when faculty meet with chairs and departments get together. We need to develop goals, areas to improve student performance. I think everybody should try to, to compete with David Jude and get their, their shelf exam scores where OB gets them. I think every department wants the student perception to be above the national average for their discipline. There's no reason for it not to be. We're a small medical school. Our kids should like it here. We look at publications by department. It's a good story. 
This is all, this is where everybody gets credit for papers of multiple authors. And you can see pretty much every department has shown some growth um, from 2011 when we were cited. And yes, it is absolutely true that the departments that got cited for no papers had papers, but we didn't report papers. <laughs> so, so now we're getting better at, at documenting what we're doing, but we do need to do more. How much? How about a report a year from every faculty member? Everybody writes something, is a co-author on something every year. It's possible. It really is. It's possible. It's not crazy. Heck, if you got money back on your taxes for doing it, you'd do it. Some of the stuff McCarthy makes you do for meaningful use is worse than this, right? I mean, come on. This is, this is something that's doable. It's part of being at a medical school. A report a year from everybody. And our, and our volunteer faculty, let's encourage them to, to, to write, and let's, let's put some, some carrots in there. You know, there are already implications for promotion and tenure for us in the tenure track, but maybe even the volunteer track, the decision to move somebody to associate or full professor, <coughs> maybe this should be related at least in part by some evidence of scholarship. Collaborative projects, individual goals discussed with, between faculty and mentors, faculty and colleagues, with periodic meetings with their chairs. And this should also be discussed at department meetings. I know we talk about money and whether we're going broke or whether we're going to have a margin, that's important too. But this is something that's important. I think every department should look at their publications and see where they're going on an ongoing basis. Once a year doesn't cut it, as Dr. Kopp told me. Probably the, the only important thing I have to tell you is this. If we look at teaching research and administration as things that compete with clinical work, or research for that matter, it will be very difficult to improve. Everybody is working hard. I get it. I realize that, that, that most all of us are working hard. But you've got to look, I believe, you have to look at it as one mission and teaching, research, practice, and administration, just different facets of that mission. The not so ugly. The improvements we've seen in our clinical effort are nothing short of remarkable, and the fact that we did this at the same time that we dramatically improved our pedagogy and, and improved our scholarship is really, is really wonderful. Now we're going to have a merger of our major, major teaching hospitals, and this is going to give us an incredible opportunity, maybe even a unique opportunity. Had some bright spots. West Virginia Embry grant, I think, is fabulous. There have been several new R15 grants funded. Uh, there are some contracts with industry that are new. Uh, these, are, these are very positive things. Probably the most positive thing to my mind is that we truly matter to this community on so many levels and have a number of opportunities to work with other regional partners to expand our impact. If I'm going to go on drugs and like look at what the best future could be, my, my halcyon vision is that we're internationally recognized for training primary care physicians with a focus on rural medicine. And everybody acknowledges that, that we're really good at that. That we have great areas of investigation into relevant problems that affect this region. With, multiply, with multiple federally funded excellent programs. I would like our school to provide a student-centered experience second to none. I would like college students to
to be waking up in the middle of the night saying, how can I get into the Joan C. Edwards School of Medicine? Because I hear it is just so great to be a student. I want to see our school continue to effectively serve the primary and specialty health care needs of West Virginia and the tri-state community. I'd like to see us provide virtually all services that, that teaching hospitals can provide and, and continue to perform what I believe to be a very noble function. Thank you all for your attention. I appreciate it. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, Sasha. <laughs> Comes from US News and World Report, and it's not possible to dig deeper than just those numbers. In fact, Leah had to work pretty hard to get those numbers. Um, as you saw, we're not, we're, we're in the category of not ranked, so she had to do some work to get it uh, to the point where we even found out where we were and released those numbers I shared. Some of this can be done individual to individual, but it's tricky. To some degree, Sasha, and, and, and program directors that are in the audience, please correct me if I'm wrong, we're sort of misled by the fact that when we do surveys of program directors and ask how our students are doing, they tend to give very glowing and positive responses. But what we don't have is a, a benchmark. They're doing that for the kids from the other schools too, and it's only things like, like a, a uh, a U.S. News and World Report survey where they honestly rank schools relative to others. And again, it's not different from what the chairs and uh, uh, deans say. They're ranking us below average. Please. You know, there's lots of different ways to look at that. But honestly, Philippe, we're in a position now where I'm exhorting people who aren't publishing to publish something somewhere. And frankly, when we're up at about 250 papers a year, then we'll start working on where they're publishing. But right now, the West Virginia Academy of Sciences, if there is such a thing, I didn't know, uh, that would be fine. The West Virginia Journal would be fine. You know? Yeah. I'm if, you, if you want to describe that to funding your research, if I send my to the NIH, we're talking about apples and oranges. I'm not talking about Hong Wei. I'm not talking about Gary Rankin. You guys have to publish in journals that have impact factors, a four better, and it's just that simple. That's a different animal. But for our clinical faculty, writing something is a step past writing nothing. And worse, deciding why bother writing, because it will only be in this journal. Hey, it's somewhere. And, and frankly, some great papers have been published in crummy journals. Where was the Bowles publication on the natriuretic peptide? Life sciences. It's a rag, right? And it was a rag back then. But that's where the first paper of AMP is, is, is published. Well, thank you all for your attention.